Okay, we are ready to go. Einen schönen guten Nachmittag. Uh, welcome uh, from Bonn World Conference Center here in uh, the room. Everyone welcome, but also virtually whoever is joining. Uh, we are delighted to uh, have the opportunity to organize the event Data, Digital Innovation, Culture and Resources for Youth and Citizens Climate Action Empowerment. So uh, the co-organizers of today's event are IAI Glotcher, the International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Challenges, then the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, IEMA, University of Massachusetts, Lovell, the Climate Change Coalition, your Neum Research uh, Life Program, and Global Youth Development Institute. So the topic, uh, the, the title of uh, the event is very long, very many words. Let me briefly unpack uh, it for you. So uh, our key message here is that uh, in order to make real progress in Paris Agreement implementation, we need to change uh, our priorities, our approaches, and our theory of change is uh, telling us that youth and citizens climate action empowerment is the key to success. This is the transformative potential and uh, the other elements of the title say that we believe that uh, data, digital innovation, digital tools, culture and uh, different types of resources, be it financial resources, intellectual resources, capacity building and this, this is uh, all the formula to success for the whole UNFCCC process, for the global climate action uh, ambitions. And uh, we are here, uh, the core of this event is uh, the digital innovation community, uh, which has formed around the Climate Chain Coalition, uh, the world's leading network uh, of organizations looking on how to use blockchain technology for climate action. And we've had already last week a networking event at the premises of the GIZ, the German Development Cooperation. And uh, now we are coming here to uh, show our solutions, our thinking, our potentials, and connect it with the process here, with the people and their needs, so that we will really have impactful solutions. Uh, brief uh, background about our endeavors with Climate Change Coalition. It was founded 2017 and was uh, then uh, co-founded by the UN Climate Change Secretariat and, and full-heartedly supported with uh, partners like Alexei. We've had the first uh, Blockchain for Climate exhibit uh, at the COP23. It was here in Bonn and uh, We've been then at the uh, COP25 in Madrid, where we said, uh, let's uh, be broader, not only blockchain, but also in general, the digital innovation community. Stephen Haft is today with us from Ethereum. Uh, he was there as well. And uh, we, we are providing this uh, space and these opportunities for uh, connecting the digital solution providers with the UNFCCC process. Last year, we've had for the first time uh, our own pavilion at the, the COP27, the Digital Innovation and Digital Art for Climate Pavilion. And we think that COP28 is now our big window of opportunity where this kind of potential, this kind of approach uh, like uh, we have will help to make COP28 a big success and we have different uh, conversations and uh, preparatory activities uh, with partners in the UAE, with partners in Slovenia, uh, we have secured our space for the Digital Innovation Pavilion in uh, the Expo City Climate Change Coalition, uh, 360 uh, members, more than 360, uh, really uh, wide global coverage. And my organization, IAI, is uh, an observer organization in the UNFCCC process based in Klagenfurt in uh, Austria. And we are building the Global Challenges Action Empowerment Ecosystem Glotcher with culture, technology, and organizational innovation with the vision to empower ever, everyone everywhere to make meaningful and regarding climate action. And uh, yeah, the vision is that there will be a competence center, a multi-stakeholder partnership uh, that will build the data and digital innovation ecosystem and the tools for citizens and youth 
climate action empowerment, and uh, one key initiative that my organization has is Digital Art for Climate, where we bring the new visions of desirable futures and the social energy, the hard power of the creative community and young artists to the UNFCCC process and turn these artworks into uh, non-fungible tokens, uh, really creating uniquely identifiable digital assets and uh, managing them in, uh, in a way that uh, we can uh, uh, use it for resource mobilization, but also as the basis for developing it further in the system where each uh, action of uh, citizens or young people in particular can be documented and uniquely identified, uh, uh, verified and uh, registered in a global registry so that uh, with this kind of tool, blockchain enabled tool, we will have then the means to reward uh, people for what they are doing and that young people, citizens can become micro climate entrepreneurs based on this technology and uh, because technology adoption is difficult, but uh, uh, with artwork, uh, we believe that uh, we uh, can uh, take the people, the ordinary people on our journey and bring this also to schools. Yeah, uh, some highlights, uh, this initiative, Digital Art for Climate, we uh, have had today a press conference where we've announced the plans for this year. Uh, the theme will be co-creating the future. We will have a big uh, festival in Austria between, uh, no, not so big, uh, uh, to, uh, between the 13th and 20th of August, about 25 people, uh, team members and partners. We will work on the further details of the competition and then start it in a public event on the 19th. And we will have, uh, uh, conference and exhibit at the UN headquarters in New York in September. We will present the Digital Art for Climate Entertainment Hub at JITEX Impact. There's a big uh, tech show in Dubai in October and at the f uh, Future Blockchain Summit. And uh, yeah, uh, we will have also uh, stories in the metaverse. Uh, today we'll uh, tell us something. We're working on citizen climate action up uh, and uh, several resource mobilization initiatives. Our slogan, our vision is that uh, there will be an individual climate action dashboard app, a white labeled one where, where each uh, organization, city, NGO, uh, company can have it for uh, its networks and its outreach uh, where people will be able to get guidance on what, to, what kind of decisions to make and to document their actions and uh, we are working on a global registry for uh, climate action documentation uh, and uh, registration. We have an EU project in the Interreg Central Europe program, Just Energy Transition for Central Europe. There we are developing a global challenges, uh, global challenges mapping tool, which is uh, our way of uh, structuring data gathering on citizens' climate action data and local climate action potentials, uh, documentation. And uh, another uh, project is the Interreg, uh, in the Interreg Slovenia Austria program, the Citizens Climate uh, SEAT project uh, with uh, Tadej Slapnik, who I'm now asking to take the floor to say a few words about uh, what are the perspectives of Slovenian uh, solution providers and partners for climate action and COP28. Thank you, Miroslav. Greetings to everybody. Uh, as uh, Miroslav already exp explained, we are really proud that we are partnering with uh, uh, GLOCA uh, at the Interreg uh, project Slovenia-Austria, uh, company Probit and the uh, city Velenje joined the initiative to build and to develop a, a platform uh, to incentivize uh, citizens uh, on their concrete engagement fighting climate change. So hopefully we will be successful with the application and we will develop this uh, cross-border solution that we would like, of course, to go uh, and to develop it on international level. I will also mention uh, World Metaverse Council, uh, where uh, Miroslav is also one of the founding members and leading the 
working group for sustainability, where we, together with the partners, uh, on the basis of a flagship initiative uh, from last year, a conf COP conference, uh, regional COP conference in Dubai, uh, where we initiated initi initiative to develop first ever uh, metaverse for COP conference. Uh, we developed this solution and last year in Egypt at COP27 in collaboration with GLOCA and Climate Change Coalition, we actually uh, uh, organized for the first time side event uh, in Metaverse for COP conference. Uh, in, uh, for this year, we are building uh, MetaCOP28 where we are including more countries, more, more cities and more organizations of course, with the main goal to develop inclusive solution for collaboration on global scope with a focus particularly on youngsters. We know that metaverse uh, uh, solutions are um, widely used mostly by young people. So we believe that with the MetaCOP28, we will be able, of course, to uh, include them uh, globally and, of course, uh, have the possibility to co collaborate with the solution which is really CO2 uh, uh, with low CO2 impact. So to conclude, uh, thank you Miroslav for your collaboration. Thank you all uh, uh, partners of Climate Change Coalition. We are looking forward to our collaboration. Thank you very much today uh, for being such a great leader, for using blockchain for the SDGs in Slovenia and uh, connecting globally and uh, bilaterally on this topic. So next on our list of uh, speakers, partners, is uh, Tim Damon, Global Youth Development Institute. We are working together since uh, COP22, Marrakesh, uh, when you have been younger focal point, and uh, your systemic approaches are very well aligned with our uh, vision as well. Yes, thank you, Miroslav. It is indeed a pleasure all the collaboration that we've had and I appreciate how you are bringing together all of these partners outside of my own expertise you know I'm not at all the tech digital expert but uh, I will say I'm an expert when it comes to action for climate empowerment and youth-led climate action and how they meaningfully engage in these processes and make all this work at the ground level and that's where there are these many systemic challenges that we see which impede youth-led climate action uh, there's a lack of access to finance, to institutional structures. You know, it's not easy to even necessarily create an NGO or have the civil society space in a lot of the countries where young people are trying to do this work. You know, difficulty having access to political processes to have their voices heard. So there's many of these challenges, but we see the progress now as we're building up with all of the digital innovation and these technologies to have some progress in this landscape. So for example, if we have these avenues by which we are able to better identify and track and reward youth-led climate actions, that can help to solve some of the gaps in terms of building the confidence of potential investors or sponsors, those who can support those initiatives, to have the confidence to do so. Because one of those barriers is that you know youth NGOs tend to be less formal, less experienced. If a potential donor has a very rigorous set of standards for compliance and accountability, that may be a an unsurmountable barrier for a lot of youth organizations, or the scale of the money is so small that it doesn't even register on the radar for big philanthropies or these organizations. So again, if digital technologies can help us to scale that finance flow down to that smallest grassroots level, that can really unlock a lot of potential that otherwise the system is just <laughs> ignoring and relegating to voluntary work or not even being feasible. And in this light, it was also very encouraging that we had last week the meeting which Miroslav also convened over at the GIZ headquarters on digital innovation where there were a lot of other really good discussions that we had around some of these same issues and how we can move forward on them. So certainly really looking at the systemic level of how do we link all of these pieces so that young people will really be able to realize their full potential for climate action because we know they have the passion, we know they have the new ideas, but they also have the ability to be the innovators, the entrepreneurs, whether that's in a, a business sense or a policy sense or 
cultural transformation sense, any of these different areas, but they really need the help. And that's where these intergenerational partnerships, such as I've enjoyed with Miroslav and uh, all of his colleagues, uh, are really so critical. And so if we can get all of us together on the same page, then I think we really are going to be able to make that breakthrough difference that we need, that uh, we won't accomplish our goals by 2030 if we don't figure that out. So thank you again, Miroslav, everyone. Always happy to be learning from all of you on, on all these tools and how we utilize them. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks, and also happy to learn from you. Uh, and uh, the next uh, on our agenda is uh, Dr. Uh, Avid uh, Bromik. Um, he has a very interesting initiative. Uh, he's an environmental scientist and climate solutionist. Center Thank you, and hello, everyone. Google. I'm really happy Just to be, second, second, be here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Center for Research and Sustainable Societal Transformation from Karlstadt University, and he's going to present a concrete example, the long game on how uh, digital tools um, and innovative uh, climate action learning uh, approaches uh, and structuring approaches can help to build the mass movement for climate action. So now let's uh, go full screen and Dr. Avid, please. Thank you and hello everyone. I'm really happy to be digitally be here and talk about this important topic. I'm Avid Homik. I'm the research director of Center for Research on Sustainable Societal Transformation at Karls University, Sweden. And I'm representing here a project called The Long Game that we initiated during COP27. So I would like to quickly introduce you to the Long Game team. So we got uh, Mark McCaffrey, who is based in France now, who is the founder of Ecos. Uh, at the UN climate change community. Then we got Michel Vartanian, who is uh, currently involved with the UNFCCC processes, but also a global markets technology expert. Uh, I myself and uh, Juliet Rooney Vargra, who is a professor of MIT Lowell and the director of Climate Change Initiative, who are developing simulations and also applying them for the educational purposes, not only at schools, but also across political sphere. So um, we really need rapid transformation to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and also to limit global warming uh, by uh, one to five degrees Celsius. And so we are looking at the photo of Easter Parade at the Manhattan Street, uh, which are uh, 13 years apart. So in the left picture, you see that is no car. Um, combustion engine cars, whereas in the right side, there is no horse wagon. Uh, just within the matter of 13 years, a transformation system that has been evolving over hundreds of years uh, has qualitatively transformed from a horse wagon based system to a combustion engine based system. So this is the type of transformation and rapid transformation and qualitative change that we are looking for to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Now, um, what could lead to that? The research that me and colleagues led in uh, 2020 shows that there are six interventions that can come from the political spheres, particularly from the political spheres that can lead to such rapid transformation. And one of them is education and engagement. And that's exactly I would like to talk to you about today. Another piece of research that we also published in 2020 that shows that there is a climate action sweet spot at the communities to city scale comprising 10,000 to 100,000 people. That we looked at a range of uh, climate solutions, 80 climate solutions developed by Project Drawdown, and we found that 80% of the climate solutions can be implemented at the scale of the, of the sweet spot. And that can already lead to half of the emissions reductions targeted in the Paris Agreement. And we found that education can be a fantastic entry point because at schools, we have the infrastructure in place in order to hit this climate action sweet spot to lead to this transformation at scale. The second reason why we are advocating for education is something we call active hope. What Joanna Macy put it beautifully, uh, being hopeful by actively engaging into, into projects that you choose for. So we know that there is a generation left with climate trauma, eco-anxiety that don't see any future. So we would like to help them by actively engaging them into climate action projects. So our target is that we would transform the schools into living labs through climate, climate education. 
And uh, finally, something that our colleague uh, Juliet from the Enro Simulation uh, Lab found out that actually gamification can lead to such transformation, such self-efficacy. So they have been testing that acro uh, across the world with the politicians, with, uh, with the schools. And what they found that people immediately feel the agency that they can be part of this transformation at the same time get into this active engagement with this climate action projects. And so we, we took this granted. So, so eventually that what we are after. So what is long game about is basically a game that can transform the discourse of climate action. So you wanna have an app or a digital technology that would foster that game, inform the schools and, uh, and the students, at the same time transform them by giving them hope, healing their trauma into uh, the engagement in, uh, into the climate action projects. And so we are really working together with the Digital Innovation Hub Community Digital Art Initiative and the UNICEF and uh, Greening Education Partnership. So we hope to take it forward. And our current focus is on actually to identify this 100,000 communities comprising 100,000 people. So uh, breaking down the 10 billion people that will inhabit this planet by 2050 and then intervening at those goals, using them as an entry point through this game, the long game. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Avid. And it's really a very high potential initiative. And we are looking forward uh, to working uh, to join forces also at our festival. Dr. Avid has said he will join us there. And uh, this kind, ev everybody sees that we need an app. We need a citizen, cities app. Uh, we need um, organizational apps and so And we have to. Uh, collaborate that at the in the background at the bottom of it there will be a shared uh, data architecture for uh, reporting individual climate action and uh, for uh, evaluation and uh, registration and now I'm uh, delighted to welcome uh, Sarah Mukherjee and Martin Baxner from the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment we are happy that we are this year for the first time uh, jointly organizing this side event. And uh, please tell us more about skill development, capacity building, and the areas in which you are leading. Thank you so much, Mira. And uh, yes, hello to everybody and hello to colleagues. What a great set of presentations we've heard so far. So I shall be kicking off and then Martin will be uh, following up with two, I promise you, very so short and sweet presentations. So I am speaking from a sweltering, well, this is what we call in the UK sweltering anyway, it's about 25 degrees, but for early summer, that's really hot in the UK. And I was very aware when I was putting some thoughts together for this presentation that before too long, many of us will be traveling to the United Arab Emirates for COP28 held in a year which has already seen record-breaking temperatures across Europe and Southeast Asia. And of course, when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has recently and urgently reminded decision makers that time was really running out to make a difference on reducing greenhouse gases. Now, we all know that living a low carbon life is sometimes difficult and complex. Now, those words we are traveling to the COP later this year just crystallize it, doesn't, don't they? And I've personal experience of speaking with people across the world in minoritized communities who sometimes feel that they are being nagged or hectored or told what to do. And as we heard from our previous speaker, that sometimes there's a lot of anxiety and, and hopelessness about the future. But there is another way of viewing the transition to a low carbon society, and that is through the prism of sustainable, high value and highly skilled jobs that every single country is going to need in their economy and their infrastructure in order to make this shift that we're all talking about, the jobs that will bring economic value and prosperity and zero carbon to communities around the world. So we all know that these jobs are vital. 
But in our opinion, there's often a lack of clarity which goes as far as magical thinking from policymakers when it comes to how these jobs are going to be delivered. For example, we're going to need thousands of thousands more electricians to put in all the EV charging points we're going to need for low carbon cars. We'll need thousands more doctors to be trained in appropriate medicine and skills to meet the demands of a climate exhausted population. And we're going to need more foresters and farmers who can be skilled in regenerative forms of agriculture and forestry to replace what we have been taking year and after year from the planet. So unless we get the skills and training in place, we are not going to have these jobs. And despite the fact that businesses often put skills and training right at the top of what they're asking for from governments, the subject doesn't seem to be sufficiently sexy, if you like, to be a priority for many policymakers. So we at IEMA are urging the delegates at COMP28 to come together and make sure that the need for a rapid expansion of skills and training in sustainable practices is added to the final cover text of the meeting. We're doing this because we think this would give a really clear signal to businesses and industrial sectors that policymakers get it. They recognize that training and skills need to be delivered at pace, and this will underpin the green revolution. It will also help people with climate anxiety and worry find practical and sustainable solutions in jobs that can be immensely rewarding wherever you're doing them and however you're doing them. So that's our ask. Overall, I'll now hand over to Martin to give you a little bit more of our detail. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and uh, hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be sharing the platform with so many uh, distinguished speakers and um, really enjoying the content. Um, a, a couple of things that I want to do. I Firstly, um, we're involved in a, something called Green Jobs Delivery Group, um, where we are creating um, momentum behind um, whole economy transition to um, one which is green, but also understanding what this means in terms of jobs and skills. And I think there are some interesting learning points from that process in order to mobilize um, many millions of people into uh, that skills development program so that they can uh, meet the the demand that Sarah has, has uh, and others have just been outlined. I think for us, we see um, firstly um, a big growth potential in green jobs, but we all re also recognize that um, actually reskilling the whole of the workforce is going to be absolutely critical if we're going to make this transition. Um, well over 80% of the current workforce for 2030 is already in employment, and they're going to have to do something different if we're going to succeed in our transition to rapidly reduce emissions and um, become more resilient to a changing climate. And so understanding what that means in practice is really important. Secondly, at a national level, it's really important to have that data to understand what's happening in labour markets. and many countries aren't in a position to be able to understand what's happening in terms of supply and demand of people going into green jobs um, and it's very difficult to measure transitions in terms of skills acquisition for people who are already in work so that's a challenge um, we see a real need for the alignment of both climate policies at national level and skills development so um, if hydrogen is part of the solution um, in some parts of the world, then it takes quite a long time to develop a workforce that is skilled and competent and capable of dealing with hydrogen-based um, fuel carriers um, and, and the deployment of that technology, similarly with carbon capture and storage, but also in terms of, um, like Sarah said, having sufficient number of people with electrotechnical capability if we're going to rapidly move away from fossil fuels and become more dependent on renewables and, and, and electrification of heat and cooling as well as mobility. Um, so for us, we see this as being absolutely critical. We also see um, a really important um, transition in terms of um, places and communities and workforces which are highly dependent on fossil fuels and understanding what a just transition means. For us, we see four shifts that are underway already, and this is built on some of the work that we did with um, 
uh, the consultancy Deloitte um, on a green workforce transformation. I'll perhaps um, at the end, I'll put a link to this report into the chat. So firstly, we see a massive growth in the, um, the role of sustainability specialists in organizations. Um, we see demand outstripping supply. And one of the concerns that we have is around the competence of people who are developing those strategies in organizations. Um, but we're certainly seeing that boards are um, increasingly requiring sustainability to be properly integrated into their corporate strategy and understanding what that means in terms of delivery. Secondly, and crucially, we're seeing um, the growth of um, environment and climate considerations into all job roles. And for that, we're seeing um, whether it's in procurement, whether it's in logistics, whether it's in product design, whether it's in finance, then there's a big upskilling that's required within firms. And I think one of the things that's really important is that whereas general awareness raising is um, helpful, very quickly you move to understand that actually bespoke and very specific training and support is required because the needs to embed climate change throughout, throughout for example, engineering design um, in terms of life cycle assessment, material choices, the way in which a product might be used in a use phase and at the end of its life is very different than that might, than might be required, for example, for planning logistics or indeed for procurement processes. So understanding what that skills acquisition needs to be um, is really important. Um, transition plans for people in those communities which are dependent on fossil fuels, many of them have critical skills which are going to be needed in a cleaner, greener, sustainable economy. And also um, harnessing that is going to be a really important uh, driver in terms of having the capability to, to transition. And then finally, there's the development and acquisition of new skills in jobs that, are, that aren't here at the moment, but will be needed as part of that transition. In our work, we developed um, a framework um, for organizations to understand both their own internal capability, but also across different job families, be able to plan in terms of their um, knowledge and understanding the skills that are required in a particular role, the behaviours that might need to change in order to fulfil that and the competencies across a whole suite of different activities um, for organisations to be able to plan this. And we've seen this now starting to be deployed in major companies, including in food and drink, where their understanding of the granularity that's needed in terms of that workforce development um, is starting to bear real dividends, but is also actually tra transforming the way in which their workforce is thinking about things. The final point, and I was really um, uh, kind of good to hear about gamification for young people. Actually, we're engaged with you know an incredibly large company who is developing a whole series of micro credentials in terms of video content. So um, it's called Stickerbook, and it's about encouraging people to go on that learning journey in many different ways in their own time um, with content that's relevant to them. And you can tell by looking at me that I'm kind of moving towards the end of my career, but actually the way in which, well, thank you, Sarah, that's very kind. But I think the way in which we see uh, younger people who are entering the workforce, the way in which they learn and acquire knowledge and understanding and capability is changing rapidly. And therefore, we have to adapt the ways in which we build capacity and capability in workforces um, with the learning tools that are, a, that are relevant, not relevant to how I might have learned in the past. So we're incredibly excited by the transition and the opportunity. We think it's absolutely essential that um, greater attention is placed both at national level in terms of that um, focus on green jobs and green skills and the structures that are needed to really embed that across the economy um, of every country um, under the Paris Agreement, but also crucially to give support to organisations to be able to embed this in a real practical sense in terms of toolkits and content so that they can accelerate forward. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm conscious that there's a very packed schedule and it's been wonderful to be able to share our insights with you. Thank you very much, Sarah and Martin, uh, and thanks for your great work that they are doing and building in uh, the 
skill sets uh, for the workforce for the big uh, transition, big transformation that is needed. And uh, now another uh, great partner and friend, Alexei Shadrin, Evercity, IO, and the Climate Change Coalition Digital Finance Team Leader. Please tell us how you are uh, empowering uh, youth and citizens and uh, how you are building the data and digital innovation infrastructure for climate action. Uh, thank you so much, Miroslav. Um, hi, everyone. So my um, digital innovations for, for climate journey started here six years ago in Bonn at the um, COP23 climate yeah. conference where we met with Miroslav, with Tom Bauman, with Joseph Pelland, some of the other players. We started a climate chain coalition which united the early stage uh, climate innovators and um, so six years passed, right? A lot has changed. First, everyone thought we we're crazy and uh, we we're trying to, you know, kind of bring something dangerous to, to the, you know, to the global agenda and climate and maybe something harmful for the climate. But we had um, people who believed in us in the secretariat and six years showed that uh, we were actually right that uh, digital solutions is a huge enabler for the climate change mitigation and adaptation and broader UN SDG agenda and can solve a lot of problems, help us raise financing to reach the UN Sustainable Development Goals and meet um, the targets for the Paris Agreement. So this is now um, not being questioned. And uh, during the six years, we were not just uh, resting uh, we were doing very active work and we've been developing the digital infrastructure, doing pilots in various countries, meeting you know, other uh, people and stakeholders, showcasing them what digital innovations can do. And uh, right now, what we can say is that um, digital innovations not only can save the climate and prove that, but also they're creating a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunities for citizens and youth. And uh, recently, I was invited to the Jungo uh, reception at the Bonn Rathaus. And it was great to see that there are more young people year by year engaged in the negotiation pro process, in the climate process. Uh, but there was something uh, a bit disappointing that I found out, that many young people from many countries around the globe they referred to the grant funding that uh, you know, they kind of rely on to attend the climate conference, to do their projects. And what I want to say is that grant funding is, is great. But right now, digital technologies are giving you guys and girls and all the others <laughs> the opportunity to you know, be more actively engaged in um, climate change mitigation and adaptation and um, get sustainable sources of funding by using um, sustainable finance. I mean, carbon credits, carbon forwards, green debt instruments, the combination of those uh, biodiversity credits. So we're now living in a very exciting times where digital technologies are starting to, to get wider adoption and they give opportunity for you to innovate, to start your ventures, to you know, unleash your entrepreneurial spirit and not only uh, get the financing needed for you to travel to, to the climate conference and Dubai and beyond that, and uh, connect with like-minded people from around the globe, but truly make your um, uh, home countries, make the places where you live a better place and more sustainable. Uh, and this is what actually digital innovations bring to the table. So they create jobs, they create opportunities for you to become entrepreneurs and get sustainable sources of funding and I'm not talking only about climate finance, I'm talking about gaming, I'm talking about education, I'm talking about many, many other things. So you should be aware of that. And uh, you're welcome to contact us at the Climate Change Coalition personally in LinkedIn or, you know, going to our website, um, our social networks, looking at what 
is going on, what's happening, and we will be happy to assist you in bringing those digital technologies to your cities, to your towns and villages, to your regions, and helping you to establish and deploy them being the main beneficiaries of that. Because we strongly believe at the Climate Change Coalition that digital technologies, it's not another tool to control the world by corporations or nations. It's a tool uh, to enable very active uh, citizen climate action and youth climate action. And we will be happy if uh, you will engage into that and we're here to assist. So thank you so much and let's talk, let's meet at COP and innovate together. Bravo, thank you very much, Alexei. Yeah, uh, it's really, uh, okay, if it's a quick uh, ad hoc comment. Uh, if you come closer and uh, use the microphone. No, it should work, quickly. Sorry, just a quick comment. How is it possible for you to have an event that has youth in the title and for the first 45 minutes it has mostly been, sorry, I don't want to, you know, come offend anyone, but how, how is it possible to have an event that has youth in the title, is all about youth empowerment and for the first 45 minutes uh, it's all about not young people telling young people how to get involved, how to, I but don't know. Tim Damon is a Global Youth Development Institute. You, d you didn't notice him. Oh, I did very much notice him, but I still would like to maybe just um, note that I think it would be very helpful, especially at these sorts of conferences, if you want to include uh, youth perspectives to give them a proper stage and not just sort of a token stage of having one or two or however many young people three. on stage. That's just a comment I would like to make. Okay, Thank you. No, Thank you so much for the comment. Uh, I want to say that uh, any event should have um, every representative uh, sitting by the table. Because any development, and of course sustainable development, it's an exchange of thoughts, of experience, of energy, and uh, co-creation. So I think, yeah, here it's being fulfilled. Yeah, I also think that it's fulfilled. Tim was here and he was the third speaker, but uh, we will come also to additional uh, youth perspectives. Uh, but now, according uh, to the agenda, we have uh, next uh, Wes Geisenberg, uh, HBAR Foundation, Hedera, Blockchain Ecosystem, who is also a systemic uh, thinker. And uh, Wes, please. Absolutely, and I just want to say thank you, Miroslav, for having us. Um, HBAR Foundation is a proud supporter of the Climate Change Coalition. And um, for those who don't know about the HBAR Foundation, our sustainable impact funds, um, we're looking to help bring the balance sheet of the planet to the public ledger. And as part of that, we have five goals that we like to help enable. Um, and that involves empowerment of many parties to participate in the process. Um, those five goals are making climate finance auditable, digitizing and open sourcing methodologies so many can participate, um, and not just the methodology creation process, but methodology review, project data review, in a way that that's open and collaborative so we can improve these processes. Of course, as part of that, scaling validation and verification is important of every project in the climate process, not just things like offsets, adaptation credits in the future, biodiversity credits, but also things like emissions measurement projects that are critical uh, to our one and a half degree goals. Additionally, having a climate, uh, climate credit uh, price, a global credit price um, that is transparent where we actually can trace every single trade that is happening, whether it's happening at an international level or a voluntary markets level, we think is important for the transparency and success of markets in climate activity. Um, and these credits are all digitally enabled with verification that's publicly auditable, with open source methodologies where public can participate and track uh, climate finance. And we get into NDCs or even ESG reporting for companies that that's all available and open for everyone to participate. And as part of what we do, we, we run a grant fund um, that supports the adoption of open source solutions, digital public goods, for every step of those five goals. So create, creation of financial instruments where we can engage with institutional stakeholders, different actors, um, where we can create methodologies in their digital format natively so that anyone can participate in the methodology creation process. It's not stuck in an institutional consultant driven process, but something that can actually work from the ground up for everyone to participate. And one of the things that 
we want to leave as a call to action as part of this event is for you to participate. And we, we work with different folks um, across communities to build out methodologies or improve methodologies that already exist um, so that we can get better reviews on what actually works, not just out in the field, but in the academic communities and point out opportunities to improve in a positive way. Um, we provide resources, of course, to do that. We've had events that the HBAR Foundation sponsored and supported, such as hackathons. Um, recently, we just uh, we we had a hackathon that operated in um, April or ended in April, where we uh, gave out rewards for developing net new methodologies that previously weren't digital. And we find other ways to train uh, different parties coming from different perspectives on how to adopt these technologies. Um, we do different enablement sessions where we can do webinars and other, other capacity building where we give step-by-step -step approaches of how to build a methodology that can be adopted um, to create an environmental project, measure emissions, or take other different steps in improving the, the digital climate processes. And so we mostly want to invite everyone here to engage with us, find ways to participate, use digital tools as a way to accelerate climate action, and we welcome your participation in our community, the Hedera community, as the HBAR Foundation Sustainable Impact Fund. And we invite anyone who wants to participate to reach out to us on LinkedIn or, or hbarfoundation.org slash apply. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Wes, for your great work and for your cooperativeness. And now to Dolphine Maguero, Green Youth Climate Fund. What uh, are the resources or um, kinds of support that young people need in Kenya to be empowered for climate action. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you for standing up for young people. I think we should need to encourage young people to be more active or engaged. I am also part of the Yungo Network, the Follow Finance and Markets Working Group. So uh, basically, like you said, I'm part, I founded the Green Youth Climate Fund Institution. And like you said, we can't do it without youth. So tomorrow we'll be having Yungo to critique what we have on the table to see how we can uh, go forward together if agreeable, basically. So it's pretty voluntary. So other than that, basically, I'm glad that the uh, speakers online talked about uh, the issue of green jobs, because for us as an institution, we have two key focus programs. So we have the Adaption for Green Jobs program, apart from the fund, which we're looking to design programs that could help transform the society and the community. So Adaption for Green Jobs program is basically centered around developing countries like Africa, because we know that Africa has a very large, huge youth population who are unemployed. And then the, the, the key thing about Africa, the main priority is adaptation. So how we're trying to bridge the gap, how can adaptation, you, young people can be involved in adaption initiatives that in a manner that creates green jobs for young people. So this is something that you're working up on, basically focused on countries such as Africa. Then we have the Youth for Green Growth Program. Like the speakers have said, we have now the concept of just transition, basically, because we're looking to have, uh, starting locally, but go thinking very ambitious globally. We need to support young people, especially in developed countries who, who are, let's say, high emitting countries. For example, youth in China, for example, is a very good example. So yes, China is one of the largest pollutants. And how can we basically come in in a manner that youth support in the transition, basically? We, we, we might not be able to force the government to shut down all the industries, but we can come in to how work with young people, especially in countries, high emitting countries like China, in the transition so that young people can find some sort of employment or jobs within China to support the transition. So basically looking at what best thing we can do uh, basically making the best out of the worst possible situation. So other than that, we are starting locally because we need to coordinate young people. Like you said, you can't work without young people. So we are supposed to start a pilot in Tana River County in Kenya. So what are we going to do? Basically, we're looking to tap into the existing climate financing mechanisms. And in Kenya, we have a very evolved system in terms of we have up to the sub-national climate change funds. So World Bank recently funded sub-national governments to, to set up climate change funds. So where do we come in? We're looking to set up sort of youth climate finance barrazas at the grassroots level. So if you have like three barrazas in a county like Tana River, then we, ca we have mobilized youth enough capacity, build them to an, a very high extent to be able to approach their county government and demand that 1% of the county climate change fund to go to young people. So we start leveraging on that. And as the youth fund, we look for sources outside uh, 
with from various partners to co-finance that particular mechanism. We're also looking to set up a uh, youth climate national climate change council, uh, national youth climate change council, because Kenya has set up a national climate change fund. So what we're going to coordinate young people, members of parliament, young member of parliament, every stakeholder to go to their national government, Kenya national government, to demand for two percent of the national climate change fund to go to young people. Then we come in to co-finance that, looking to upscale that also to Africa, because FDB is is having the Africa Climate Change Fund. So how can we mobilize young people, rally them, support them, capacity build them to an extent that they can approach the FDB or whoever is running the Africa Climate Change Fund to give 5% of that fund to go to young people. Then we can go to basically uh, co-finance that with the various partners. And then at the global level, of course, going to have negotiations with Jungo around how can we tap on existing funding like GCF? How can we make GCF work for us? Like you said, nothing for young people. So why are we fighting climate change if not for the young people? So GCF should, uh, very politely, should also work for young people. Currently, it's not working for, for most countries because it's so technical. It's not working for majority of the countries, fairly developing countries, and it's supposed to support us. So how can we make GCF work for young people? How can we work GF work for young people? How can the Standing Committee on Finance speak more to the needs of young people? How can everybody in, um, ensure that young people are part of the climate finance discussion and not just, you know, uh, uh, being called to rubber stamp in these workshops, in this platform? So how can young people be coordinated enough to be able to demand for existing climate finance? And also how can we partner with the various, uh, various entities, various people, to be able to enhance what we are already doing and able to collaborate to ensure that young people get to meaningfully participate in climate change? Because young people cannot meaningfully participate in climate change and climate action without access to financing. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Caroline uh, Kuba from Climates Austria. You are the uh, UNFCC Youth Delegation of Austria, uh, visual communication expert, uh, Klima Reporterin. Please uh, tell us how you see uh, young uh, people's climate action empowerment. Um, well, firstly, thank you for having me on such short notice. So, hello, I am Caroline Kuba. I have a background in design and communication science from Vienna and Boston, and I am the visual communications expert for the UNFCCC Youth Delegation of Austria. The Austrian delegation believes that the translation of the information and decisions made here in the DSB and the, C and the COP into something not just understandable but approachable for the youth is something that needs to be taken into account and prioritized when it comes to the making or not making, of decisions. Something that will have a vast impact on the life of everyone, something that everyone should be aware of. In order to be involved, the youth needs to be informed. But the subject of climate change can easily be overwhelming and hard to take in. Scientific jargon and complex data may enhance socioeconomic disparities and lead to cognitive dissonance and an inability to approach or partake that results in young people being excluded from something that they will even be more affected by than the generations that came before them. But what can we do? And this is where art comes in. In child psychology, it is a common courtesy to present young patients with pen and paper in order to give them a chance to explain and explore emotions and situations. Partially because they are lacking the vocabulary, but also because some things are just too vague, too far off for words to properly portray them. And even older individuals still fall back on Hieronymus Boss paintings and Huxley stories and sometimes Disney's Wall-E to make a point that might be gruesome but graspable. Art is something that can be understood. It can be used as a platform and uh, to explain, explore, and most importantly, engage. Turning to the idea of using art to establish abstract ideas around one of the big technological advances of recent times that has been getting more and more traction in the global society has been the public accessibility of AI. These tools use prompts to create pictures that are sourced from parts of pre-existing materials. Not just young people can utilize AI to explore scenarios and ideas and resolve issues of the climate crisis in a very complex but understandable and appealing manner. 
Just use five seconds to imagine what your hometown or city could look like if it was carbon neutral. Not quite five seconds, but still. AI can easily uh, assist in visually manifesting this and can be used as a basis to work off of. That being said, it is important to point out that there is quite a bit of controversy um, and debate concerning AI, like the fact that it re replicates part of art that is pre-existent and that there are potential dangers in hyperrealism um, that it portrays. But in conclusion, implementing art as a tool to inform young individuals about the climate crisis, something they will inevitably have to deal with, can be a big step towards making the crisis approachable, understandable, and allow for early explorations to establish a solution-based mindset, but most importantly, the knowledge of what they have to face. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caro. And uh, congratulations to Climates. Uh, it's a really a wonderful organization and we have uh, also uh, several years of uh, cooperation and also joint side events. And uh, your colleagues Ines from Climates International, when they've seen our uh, plan to have an event about uh, digital art uh, for climate and so, they uh, immediately approached us and said, uh, can we uh, collaborate on this? Uh, but they have left already and very happy to have you from Austria now on our podium, uh, that's great. Uh, as you were focusing on art, uh, we would like to uh, call on now uh, Mari Asada, an NFT artist from Japan, who is working on us, uh, with us on our uh, Digital Art for Climate initiative. Mari, could you please uh, join us and say a few words about uh, what you are doing using technology for climate action mobilization. Okay, if there is a connection issue or uh, attention issue, then, okay, here we are. Hi, Mari, please. Mike. Um, okay. Um, okay. 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 Oh, is it a technical issue? I, is it okay now? Yes, okay. it is. I think. Um, okay. Okay. Great. Uh, sorry about the um, uh, mic. Uh, is it possible to share the screen or maybe not? I guess so. Um, uh, you have three minutes. I can <laughs> share my. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, actually, so I, I have uh, my uh, um, presentation screen, but I couldn't share. Uh, so, okay, I start speaking anyway. So, my name is Maria Sada. Uh, I'm from Japan. I'm a visual artist and uh, NFT artist. And uh, I become a RC Japan Network uh, founding board member uh, recently. And the Earth Day is, uh, as you know, uh, established in 1970, and uh, the day to think, our, think and feel and act for Earth. And uh, the uh, Japan, Japan, uh, Earth Day Japan Network is uh, established as an official Japanese subsidiary of Earthday.org, and it is a platform to connect the Earth Day movements around the world. So we connect all the Japanese um, well, our activities all over Japan, as the Japan Network is established in uh, this year, uh, April 22nd. So, uh, I want to talk about, uh, because I'm a digital artist, so I want to talk about digital art for climate, uh, Japan. And uh, I participated, thanks for Midasura, I participated in Mina Climate Week uh, last, uh, last year, uh, April and uh, in Dubai, and I was uh, uh, participated as a speaker for three sessions, and uh, it was a great uh, uh, experience for me. I met a lot of uh, nice people like uh, Alexei <laughs> and uh, and uh, speakers all over from the world, uh, and uh, we were a panel of the blockchain work, uh, blockchain for climate, uh, really nice, uh, great uh, woman, female speakers as well. And we talked about how we can contribute uh, um, uh, climate action. For me, like as a digital artist, 
So I came to uh, um, uh, um, a theme to establish how to establish a digital for climate Japan. And uh, now I'm a co um, member of uh, Earth Day Network uh, Japan. So I decided to do it as uh, action of uh, Earth, Day, uh, Earth Day Japan Network as well. So I uh, suggested to the members and everyone uh, said agreed. So now we are doing digital for climate Japan as action of our uh, Earth Day Japan Network, um, yes. And uh, we'll make, uh, we'll uh, develop uh, digital tool together with uh, uh, Glocha and uh, uh, join uh, the digital for climate uh, global programs and join uh, COP28 uh, in Dubai uh, this year, uh, November and December. We also plan to make our uh, uh, digital for climate uh, Japan metaverse gallery because I will do a 3D graphics and metaverse uh, as a professional. So yes, and uh, we will also digital, uh, make a, a Digital for Climate Japan Award. And uh, hopefully we could bring Japanese artists uh, into this uh, artist, uh, into uh, uh, climate action and globally, uh, they can contribute to climate action. So yes, um, do you have still? Oh, do I still have time? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. uh, thank you very uh, much, okay. Mari. Uh, great yes. work, uh, and uh, looking forward to collaborate with you, and also to see you in Austria at our festival in August thirteenth uh, till twentieth yes. of August. Thank you very much. Hi. And thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Uh, and may I call now uh, Raymond van Ermen uh, from the Blockchain 100 Plus initiative. Uh, as I said, uh, these are big topics. Trans in order to be transformative, we have to take action on different levels. And a key player, of course, is the UN system. And uh, Raymond's initiative is looking how uh, our solutions can become part of the UN system. So, uh, uh, Raymond, please. Uh, Two and a half minutes you have. <laughs> yes, th thank you, Miro. I'm pleased to indeed to introduce the blockchain for UN Charter of Values and the Sustainable Development Goals Initiative. It seeks to build in an ecosystem a partnership to prevail transparency, trust, and redistribution of values in support of the UN Charter and the SDGs. BC 100 Plus added value will be to link digital innovation with system leadership in order to bring together uh, practitioners of blockchains and also those dealing with uh, in the framework of existing platforms dealing with the implementation of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we have a process in place. Uh, next week, a manifesto will be uh, released. Uh, organizations will be invited to, to join the process by signing this manifesto, presenting their blockchain initiatives, and uh, on the basis of which we will develop a certain number of uh, flagships. Uh, we expect so to be able to contribute to strengthen the multilateral system by using blockchain as a game changer to better address empowerment in view of current and future challenges. Uh, and from this standpoint, youth needs to be empowered. Uh, we, have, we are pleased to have with the Climate Change Coalition as a member of the steering committee, a key player to ensure that this youth agenda be addressed. It will be addressed in the form of a flagship on uh, youth training and empowerment, and which could in, involve all the initiatives presented today, if so decided. For this to happen, you should sign the manifesto, which will be released next week, and disseminate, which will be disseminated by Miro, and then discuss with him how you could shape together such a flagship. Over to you, Miro. Thank you very much, Raymond. And uh, perhaps also to explain why uh, we have a little bit of a shortage of time, we've had two uh, side event applications, uh, one with the Youth Climate Action Empowerment Focus and one on digital innovation. And in the end, uh, both got declined. And we've got only a few days ago, then the notification that uh, 
the youth empowerment one is uh, confirmed and then we've uh, pulled also those uh, who have been with us uh, applying for the other events so therefore uh, it is a little bit uh, crowded on this uh, side event but we have another presentation and it's a very important one because it's our digital solution provider partner from the UAE, Mohammed Al Hashimi from Islamic Coin is doing also uh, collaborating with universities and um, uh, all the relevant partners in the UAE to, and here you have also funding as I understand. Uh, let's see how we can channel right. these uh, financial resources to youth climate action. Over to you. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Miroslav. And uh, I was actually glad that we participated together last year in COP27 and looking forward to do great uh, and amazing participation together with you in COP28. So I will make it very, very, very short. I'm Mohammed. I'm artificial intelligence engineer. I'm a founder of Hack Blockchain and Islamic Coin. So how we uh, think we can help the youth uh, developing an amazing projects and products for the climate change. I think we should start from the challenges where the youth actually facing a uh, challenge uh, to be technology uh, enabled. So they need a technology platform that supports them uh, to build on their projects. And they need, on the other hand, uh, ROI or return of investment booster where uh, it makes their projects attractive to the people to put the funding. And then on the third uh, vertical, they need actually a fund uh, to help them to uh, start and do these projects. And how we solve this, actually, we have a blockchain. It's a blockchain that focus and built on ethics and values of the Sharia. So it accepts only projects that reflects with a very positive impact on the community. So this is uh, under Hack Association, which is a nonprofit organization, and we did it like this to provide it with almost no cost to the uh, community and to the youth to build their projects. So please uh, feel free to use the blockchain to put on your projects. It is Ethereum compatible. It's a layer one protocol, and it uses Cosmos and to keep the environment of the blockchain clean with the nice project. So every project will be onboarded. It will pass through two stages of voting. First voting is the community has to, to vote for the project. And second part is the board has to vote for it. So after it passed the community voting, it goes to the board just to make sure this is reflecting with a positive impact on the community. So with this way, we enabled the youth and the people who want to build technology projects uh, with a, a very smart and ethics-based blockchain. On the other hand, how to help them to have a very nice return of investment, maybe by tokenizing their projects or by uh, reaching out to the community and traffic. We are at the moment having almost 2 million community and it's keeping increasing day after day. So this community will help them and they're all focusing on ethics and values and positivity to the community will help them to have a very high return of investment. And on the other hand, we have the uh, evergreen DAO. So on the blockchain, we have built the Islamic coin where 10% of every minted coins goes to evergreen DAO. And this DAO will use it to fund the technology for the community. So they can definitely apply for the DAO to get funded. They go for the first phase again to, for the community to vote for their projects that the, 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 this project is desired and likable by the community. And then it goes to the board and then they get the fund. So. This is as simple as I can describe it. I will not take more than your, uh, from your time. Thank you for listening and hope to cooperate together in future. Thank you very much, Mohammed. And I really hope that we will be able to uh, make the connection between your pot of financial resources and your uh, technological solutions and tool and the young uh, people's project on, uh, projects on the ground uh, all around the world. Thank you very much cool. uh, for being with us. Thank and you. now we have a few minutes uh, for interaction here. Who would like to uh, share some thoughts, criticism? <laughs> Another one for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, then uh, go ahead. Uh. 
I, I hope it's clear to me, uh, or I hope it's clear to you that um, I'm not critiquing the work you do. I think the work you do is very important. But I just want to ask all of you to very honestly ask yourselves in the work that you do and the way you, um, you know, host plenaries, the way you select which groups to ask about um, the projects you do, whether youth and citizens' climate action empowerment is actually something that you mean in a serious way or in a way that's mostly used because it sounds very good and I'm sure it gets more easily approved for side events if youth is in the title. Again, I don't mean this to offend anyone. I think you're doing some very constructive work, all of you. But, um, you know, we've listened to many, um, to many solutions that I think ultimately I'm not sure how many young people actually reached by these uh, solutions day to day. Um, that's something I'm unsure of. And um, I think also coming back to your uh, comment, when you see young climate activists from around the globe, and there are many here at this conference, um, <laughs> honestly, I don't think that the challenge that they face is that they can't put their own motivation into entrepreneurial ideas. The challenges are way different. The challenges are, as some of you have outlined, as you have outlined as well, not having the financial resources to do so. Um, not having the financial resources to maybe even be at this conference. And so I think that's why it's so important that the way that we, you know, build up plenaries, the way that podiums are made up of, this tells a lot about um, who is actually sitting at the table, who is actually making these decisions. And that's something we see at this climate change conference generally, that the people most impacted by these decisions aren't usually sitting at the table. And I would just like to maybe ask for the next side event that, that you host to um, you know, look into how your podiums are made up and, and maybe have more youth speaking there um, and speak on, on the projects you do. Okay. Thanks. Uh, could you also say your name and organization? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm David and I'm one of the um, uh, youth delegates for, for Austria. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any further comments, advice, suggestions? Somebody from the uh, Teams call, virtual participants, if somebody would like to say a few words. Sarah, would you like? Uh, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll jump straight in. And I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was a, it's a, it's a very fair set of comments. Um, and uh, we do a lot of work with minoritized communities and with youth communities in uh, in the UK and across the world, and I think you're absolutely right. The, the other thing we haven't really talked about is indigenous knowledge, and we, we talk a lot to our members outside the UK and the global south who feel that they're being told what to do, and often they their communities quite understand the solutions. It's just they don't have um, the, the financial power or the skills and training in order to, to implement some of that knowledge. Um, what I can say is some of the stuff we're doing starting in the UK, but we hope to internationalise it. We've got, um, we're working with a couple of organisations to develop um, pre-university training. So between 16 and 18 year olds, often who particularly in not kind of affluent communities who want to get involved in sustainability, but can't. Um, and uh, I was one of those people, admittedly, many years ago. But I came from a, a very, um, a very poor community in the UK, and it was just completely out of my reach. And so we're trying to make sure that people who don't have the money can't do unpaid internships, can't travel, can get access to sustainability skills and knowledge, which we're going to do um, as a, a, f a free service as part of this uh, extra qualification for 14 to 16 year olds. We want to develop that further. We've just launched a Green Careers Hub, which is free, again, to anyone who wants to have a look at the website, which gives you an idea of the sort of jobs that are out there, the sort of skills and training that you would need, and the sort of salaries that you would get. All of that is free content that we've uh, we've put together, and hopefully that will help people starting out in their careers who are really keen and passionate and getting involved to help them on their journey. But you know, it is a very, very fair comment. We, we try and do as much as we can to engage all our members from 16, 17 onwards, but it is difficult sometimes when people don't have the money and don't have the resources to do so. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing this. Um, 
Any concluding remarks? We have reached the end time of our event, but I guess a few minutes we could spare. Alexei. Yeah, concluding remarks, and maybe the answer to your quote, would be that, you know, um, there are many opportunities, and the biggest opportunities are um, in, inside us, in our mindset. So it's very important to change the, the mindset first, you know, and then go for the opportunities. Because even at our round table, we um, announced several things, you know, where you could get financing, you could get support, you can get knowledge. So even here, we mentioned some opportunities, but there are many, many more. And like Bob Marley said, the first thing to getting those opportunities is to uh, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. And that <laughs> would be my message to everyone who wants to be a very active participant uh, of this process, and especially youth, of course. Thank you. Bravo. Carl? Me? No. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, well, I had it in me to turn this on, which also, I believe, was due to my mindset. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think it's great, uh, and I agree um, that this is a great space, um, and that it's amazing that so many um, options were listed here. But again, um, as it has been pointed out, I don't believe it all um, comes down to mindset, but to many outside factors. But uh, mindset is, of course, important to respond to this. Yeah. Thank you. Wes? Let's say there's many resources out there, and how we spend our time is important. You know, taking advantage of some of the opportunities that were laid out here is, you know, now on the table for anyone to look at, whether it's the resources that we can provide financially, in training, um, or in connectivity, connecting to different groups and organizations that will help enable youth to be at the table, to use digital solutions to change some of the outcomes. And sometimes what we need to do to change mindsets, not just here in this room, in this side event, but to change, change um, outlooks for folks who are at the negotiating table is to show um, what those opportunities are, and oftentimes our digital solutions can open people's mindsets because some things can't be seen until we can put it in front of them. And so taking advantage of the resources that are out there beyond just the financial ones, I think, is, is equally important to the ones that, yeah. um, you know, the opportunities that we have you heard about from the financial perspective. Uh, I think for me concluding, uh, I can say uh, something that someone really senior once told me. Uh, he said, uh, money flows in partnerships. So be open to partnerships because you can't do it alone. The more partners you have, the better. And also flows in technology and innovation. The third one I forgot. But I think partnership, innovation, and technology, that's all you need to have my takeaway. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks again uh, to all our co-organizers. I, I, I am uh, um, University of Massachusetts Lovell, Climate Change Coalition, Uranium Research, Global Youth Development Institute. I hope we have added some uh, value to the SB58 and to youth climate action empowerment on a global level. Thank you, Miroslav, for the <laughs> great and inclusive event. Thank you. Ah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you.